Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday morning for this um, talk happening in the, in the context of the collaboration with Gallery Weekend Beijing. Um, this uh, cultural exchange is three level. One, we invited the um, Chinese gallery to exhibit in Zurich. Um, um, and um, and um, secondly, we have invited curators and directors of Chinese institutions to um, to dive into the, the art scene in Zurich. And today, I'm glad to um, host together um, uh, with Gallery Weekend Beijing, thanks to the great support of the Luma Foundation, um, this panel discussion. And we're very honored to, to welcome today our panelists. Um, I will leave uh, Peter Pakesh, who will lead this, um, this, this panel, introduce all speakers. But I, I wanted to um, warmly thank you all for um, for... Uh, coming here today, um, making yourself available, some of you uh, coming expressly from uh, China. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, Peter Pakesh, uh, to say two words about um, um, his, um, his great career um, and, and summarize to not take too much time. So, um, he has been director of the Kunsthalle Basel. Uh, between 96 and 2003. Um, he afterwards directed the Kunsthaus Graz, um, where he stages different um, contemporary art exhibition. Um, one of them, um, China Welcomes You, and he's uh, actually chairman of the Maria Lasnik Foundation. So thank you, Peter, for, for leading this talk, and thank you to all of you. for this uh, wonderful possibility of an exchange that I think is a very exciting one. And I want to introduce the panelists. Uh, Greg, to my very right, Greg Yee, a Stanford scholar and founder of Inc. Studio, a very important institution in Beijing. As uh, Lu Ye, um, sorry for pronouncing it not so well, um, founder, uh, and very important uh, um, founder of Long March Studio and a very important institution for me, a gallery in Beijing, where I learned a lot of really exciting artists, wonderful space and great shows. Heike Munda, I think in Zurich is not so... Uh, she's very well known. Migo Museum, one of the major institutions in Zurich for new and advanced situations in art. Uli Sik, I think, also very well known in Switzerland as well as in China, a major person, and I also will mention my introduction statement for me of very great personal importance. And next to me, also somebody uh, very well known here in Zurich, Albert Lutz, uh, who on a more historic or larger perspective uh, curated fantastic shows uh, at the Riedberg Museum, who is the head of the Riedberg Museum, I think one of the mo foremost institutions in Europe uh, to deal with non-European art in a very kind of open and also very progressive way. Um, when I was invited to share this talk here, uh, I was. it was something which uh, is a was always very much in my mind how to deal with uh, different notions of art. And I tried to capture this in a small text that I'm going to read. When Uli Sik did invite me in 1998 to visit him in China, I was not prepared at all what I would encounter. I only understood that I was going to witness, witness something fundamental concerning the future of visual art. To explain where it did come from, I'd like to shortly tell my position in a few words. At this moment, I was the director of the Kunsthalle Basel and I'm always interested to expand the artistic radius of this institution, which was for the whole century at the forefront of artistic developments from Impressionism and Cubism to conceptual art and trans avant -garde. I was very much aware how post-war modernism has come to an end and how through the 1980s and the following years the Western 
teleological vision of art was no more applicable to an upcoming global vision of developments to come. We were used to follow a path throughout styles, through styles and achievements in the vision and the perception of the world in a developing perspective up to the triumph of abstraction and the propositions of conceptual art. When the anticipation of new visual realities of an upcoming media world needed new visual answers. Then with the end of the Cold War, there was an experience of Eastern Europe in the post-communist world, the first glimpses on Africa, African art and culture in a contemporary context, South America, Japan, and now China. Classical Western art history and theory didn't help anymore to understand. In my eyes, China had to play a unique role in all this. And I hope that today's panel will help us to find out more about it. What, why a unique role? Doesn't China's painting go along with a tradition much older than the Western one? Hasn't Chinese culture undergone more, undergone more most complex and contradictory developments throughout the last hundred years? Between tradition and modernity, between the Chinese and the Western influence, what is the meaning of contemporary art success in a contemporary China? What is the, what is the lesson for the global art world? Are these as these are questions from the perspective of a European, I'm, all, I'm also most, in, I'm most interested how these encounters with contemporary art were perceived in post-cultural revolution China. How Chinese see their tradition and the development of the last century in the light of a global art production. To be more precise, what is the relevance of American and European art today for the Far East? Not the first time in history, but at a very few significant, at a very significant moment, we watch a major encounter of profoundly different traditions and systems to perceive and to represent the world. We are also faced with completely new media, which are driven by an especially dynamic visuality. Uh, when I handed this out to my colleagues here on the table, uh, it was a very interesting answer that I got from Craig Yi. And maybe I can hand over to you uh, what uh, is your perspective on these ideas. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I guess one question I have is, do we have an hour or do we have a lifetime to answer <laughs> <laughs> your statement? Um, I think the, the, the range of issues that you see outlined in the statement are enormous. They span history. They span thousands of years of history in China, and they span certainly a very interesting one or 200 years of history in the world and in China. So um, to ground the conversation in an issue that Peter mentioned, which is a painting tradition or an art tradition in China that spans at least 2,000 years, uh, I thought we, I could spend a little time to get us all up to speed um, on some of the key issues to think about when we think about this tradition without using slides or visual images. So I'll start with just the image of a calligrapher, because the whole notion of a brush stroke on paper, okay, using ink, is really critical to understanding the language and also the world from which this language evolved. So imagine, you've all seen calligraphy, I'm sure, at some point, a series of strokes, Chinese characters. Uh, sometimes we get a sense, this was an inspiration for many artists in the 20th century in the United States, we Americans being illiterate, unable to read Chinese, we saw instead beautiful lines, movement, and this idea of gesture, very influential. That is all in Chinese calligraphy. But when Chinese people look at calligraphy, we don't see a sea of gestures. What we see is we see a sequence of gestures, one after the other, because we know the stroke order in which something is written. So it's a little bit like listening to a song. If I were to take a song and take all the notes and collapse it into one single moment, one would hardly consider that a song. But if the notes unfold in time a certain to, according to a rhythm and a meter, we're able to perceive that sequence of notes as a melody. And that's basically how Chinese people see calligraphy, is they see a sequence of strokes and they follow that performance in their own minds when they see it. So in a sense, calligraphy is a performance unfolding but in two-dimensional space. Now, what's interesting about this is it has all the same aesthetic qualities that we would associate with the performing art, song, dance, theater. All of these arts require us, the viewer, to be in the presence of the artist in order to perceive this. But because it's two human beings having an empathetic connection during a performance, we're able to feel and receive that inspiration very directly. 
So when Chinese people look at calligraphy, this is what they're perceiving. The difference is the performer is no longer present. Simply the traces of the performer performance are present. And this requires then the viewer to engage with that performance and mentally reconstruct that performance themselves. So it has qualities of performance, but it's imbued in a two-dimensional uh, visual representation that transcends time and space, meaning a thousand years later, 10,000 miles away, I can unfold that performance and experience it again. Now, when I've presented this idea to many different art historians from around the world, they feel that this is actually something that is not present in many other traditions. In fact, I've interviewed many people and they haven't been able to find another medium that has the same quality. This is the primary reason why the Chinese have never left this fundamental medium. In calligraphy, this gets transferred to painting, and therefore, even in the representation, the perception and representation of the natural world, this brush quality, this song-like performance quality is present in painting. So what does this tell us? Well, the first thing is in, Chi in the Chinese worldview, there is no separation between the body and the mind. Because what's happening is that through the physical bodily gesture, one can actually perceive the mind of the artist. This notion of the fusion between mind and body is a starting point in the Chinese worldview. Okay, dichotomy between mind and body doesn't really exist. The second thing is what's key about the brush gesture is the authenticity, what it tells you about the artist directly. It's a direct expression of the artist. And so authenticity, not as is this true or false or is this real or not real, but is this an honest, authentic presentation of the artist is extremely critical. This points to the Chinese notion that in the construction of the Chinese world, there isn't a transcendent. There isn't a transcendent truth. There isn't a transcendent God. Instead, there's this whole notion of authenticity of the individual. So the Chinese worldview is constructed around a kind of radical relativism, where what's important is the authenticity of the speaker at a particular moment. Another key is in calligraphy, okay, the words that are usually written that are of greatest value are actually poetic images. And in fact, uh, poetry, and then philosophy done through a poetic or metaphoric use of language is the key way in which Chinese use language. So the whole idea of language having a direct relationship to a transcendent objective reality, and therefore through a use of language we can come to objective conclusions about reality, that notion doesn't exist in the Chinese use of language. So from the very beginning, the Chinese have had a very a skeptical approach to language. What they're invested in is this idea of mental experience of the world, its representation in an image, and the use of language, poetic language, as a way of referencing the image in relationship to a mental experience is the key function of language. So this is a brief way of introducing how the Chinese have constructed a worldview which is radically different than the way we in the West, through our Judeo-Christian background and then through our adherence or our, our love of, of logic and language have constructed our world. Starting with that, I think we can then think about how, what the potential is for contemporary art making Again, using this worldview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then I would like to uh, go to my neighbor next to me, who just said that he would like mm -hmm. to comment yes, on this. Yes, it, it's, uh, yeah, probably you, you thought now because one has to know so many things about Chinese, let's just say now, paint, uh, land, let's say uh, landscape painting, mm -hmm. before one really can appreciate landscape and just want la landscape painting. I just want to introduce you how I had my first uh, view on a Chinese landscape painting. I was 23 and my professor, who was also curator at the Riedberg, he, he gave me a long scroll of Lu Chi, the uh, um, uh, late Ming uh, Wu school painter, uh, depicting a land scroll from from the mountains going to I could see some temples, two persons talking to each other, then uh, uh, small islands vanishing in 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 far distance in a lake. And uh, he just gave me the scroll and said, "Oh, you have to prepare for your." For, for, for your studies, you, you can talk about this scroll. And, and I install, installed a light from the side, and then I took hundreds of pictures, slides. Yeah? And then many details, these small islands, you know, just a tiny little island in a slight blue color. And, and then I took this light, and then I 
projected them on, on, on the slide projector on the wall. And really, I, think I can tell that this was without knowing anything on Chinese painting. Uh, I was, I think, what, this was one more or less my, my greatest, um, uh, what, how should I say, my greatest uh, uh, achieve, you know, just, just greatest thing I've ever had with art. So, and it's hard to, to get it any more mm -hmm. after. And only after that, I learned whatever you said. So what, and I knew whatever you said, you know, the history and, and I, knew, I learned more about this artist and so on and so on. I just want to say that if you have a good approach to, to Chinese, just this visual approach, it works also without knowing that. In calligraphy it's a little different, but uh, in painting, and I would say that everybody can enjoy and, but it's not so easy. And if you go to a museum, you just have these paintings on the wall or in, always behind the glass. So my first exhibition on, on Chinese landscape painting in 85, I tried to do something to, to, to show to our public what the same feeling I had when I first encountered. And I did a, a slide projection of with six different uh, Kodak carousels and soft edge things, so with high quality. And, and then I under, took, brought some music, Gu uh, traditional music. And so I think uh, this is a first experience. And from that on, I could really uh, know more and as more as you know about painting or calligraphy, then it gets more interesting. But just to not encourage to, to encourage you look at Chinese painting with your uh, with your knowledge of Western art or whatever you have and you can appreciate it. Thank you. And now this I think shows this yeah, really very big historical depth. But I think uh, the stunning thing for us was also this extremely contemporary situation in the last 20, 30 years. And I think, Uli, you are the right person to uh, tell us how it was for you when you entered the Chinese art world some time ago and I think became very much the expert for the contemporary. Well, it's difficult to add when it comes to the traditional to the two advocates we just heard. One pillar is the calligraphy of the Chinese tradition. The other pillar is the landscape painting. Now, when I came to China, I didn't know any of those. Uh, but after 40 years now, uh, I'm familiar with it. But that also, and I come to your question, uh, explains why it is so difficult to access for a Western, uh, uninformed, average-informed individual. Um, it's a very good description we had from Greg, but if you don't know the Chinese character and if you don't write it, it's impossible to get you know, this uh, experience a Chinese viewer would have looking at the calligraphy, because the whole performative aspect, the order of how you write the character, the different components, etc., not known. And also, when it comes to landscape painting, it takes quite some knowledge to understand what to many of us look very similar and exchangeable when we look at a large amount of Chinese landscape paintings. Uh, of course, there will be a long topic, to, an interesting topic to discuss. Why is that so? And when we now move, say, to the Western contemporary art, uh, then, of course, we can say, first of all, China adds a lot of very skilled artists to the contemporary world. Some of them just want to be part of this global mainstream, uh, mainly Western dictated type global mainstream, and they don't care about uh, their, where they come from. And then uh, you have now, uh, after you know, three, almost four decades of contemporary art in China, a 
a large group of contemporary artists who do this turn to their own roots, to their own tradition, because they understand it's a very rich resource to exploit. So I make this distinction uh, between these two groups uh, of the contemporary artists. When uh, we look, maybe a last comment, why it's so difficult for a Western audience to look, not you know, the specialists, not the people familiar with tradition, why it is so difficult. Uh, if we look at the history of uh, the Chinese calligraphy and painting, it of course is very much tied in uh, and mirrors at all times the history of China. And the history of China uh, is kind of cyclical. Uh, you have chaos, then you will have a strong ruler, will create order, it will lead to a cultural blossoming and to, to a high in art as well as other disciplines. And then eventually it will turn to chaos and this uh, has been repeating itself. It has to do with systemic issues and there has been almost no systemic change in China uh, until say a hundred years ago when things became different also for China. While in the West, uh, we have a kind of sequence of, of almost linear things from, say, uh, the Greeks uh, with, with their art creation. And then uh, you have different schools, etc., and innovation and, um, and, yeah, I would say innovation happened in a very different pace, while in the Chinese culture, because of this kind of cyclic uh, development, things l were very languid and as seen from a Western perspective, not knowing all these contexts, things look very similar for a long period of time. So in our part of the world, innovation, uh, difference, very important. In China, people for many hundred years focused much more on, on say, the Tao and its implications, which means uh, focus on expressing that spirituality in the art and in, in, uh, in writing, in music, in poetry, and kind of ritual, uh, incense ceremony, tea ceremony, etc. So it was not about creating new things, it was about expressing that particular spirituality, which very much remained the same. Thank you, Uli. I think we now got really very good scope from different perspectives how there is a big difference between uh, our view <coughs> on Chinese or European art. And I think it should be interesting for us now how we can deal with it in a contemporary praxis. And uh, Heike, I would like to ask you, as an institution who is very much involved in the research of contemporary visuality, how, uh, what can you make out of uh, what you know about Chinese arts, what you can you make out of what you know about different traditions in the contemporary world, and um, does it have an impact on your programming, on your view on, on things when you show uh, when you conceive shows? Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably the funny part. I'm the only person here on the panel who probably know the less about uh, Chinese art. Um, even if I have a private history of 20 years uh, family history in the 30s and 40s living in China and Beijing and Shanghai building up the airports, <laughs> um, and a grandmother who knew well Chinese and actually been trained in calligraphy uh, for most of her life because she loved it. It had nothing to do with contemporary art. And uh, through all this history, it feels weird. I had, um, I was actually always fearing to go to China because I knew from my great grandmother all these stories about the old China. And uh, she, I mean, she lived until she was 101. So I had a long period of time with her and I knew quite a lot about the old China and I was really afraid going there to be 
um, disillusioned. So it took me a long time to go there. So I, I have been there. Don't worry. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Come back more often too. Yeah, I would. I would <laughs> definitely love to. Um, so this has um, nothing to do. So, but I think why I was invited was also the idea more about having what, what, who, what do we serve for as a museum? Who's our public? What's our needs? Who's the um, who's who can read what? So it's like. Um, how far can we reach out to the world and still have a public who can uh, enjoy the arts and not think just in exotic terms? And when I started here, for me the problem was I was always interested in um, other perspectives. I don't want to use this buzzword globalism all the time because um, that's what since a few years every museum talks about and especially the big museums feel like they have the need to integrate this. Um, I think mostly it has to do with economy um, because they need new trustees from all over the world so somehow they need to be coming, taking this back into, into their collection and have to integrate all this. Um, as a private museum, I have none of this, um, even if Migros, of course, also loves to reach out to China. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't have none of these needs to reach out because of any trustees or things, but still I have an interest in a global language and to, to see how much can I proceed, how much, what can I do with the public? I mean, who is my public? I mean... Zurich is um, was until I would say until a very few years ago it was one of the three European centers in the art world since the 90s, or it became one of the major centers, which has of course a lot to do um, with the art market, the strength of it, and uh, the the importance of its institutions. Now we are totally fading away. Um, the <laughs> the strength of the art market is gone um, and the same is like even if this institution do have that might have the same value but somehow the the merging the merging of both is gone and we all know that there are more more and more art centers in the world which has what I have what I'm telling has to do with money resources but I'm I'm fading away from your question because I'm making trying to make some roots here and there so um, our public um, is, of course, first of all, a local and a national one. And secondly, we have less and less international people than we had before because we are a fading center. But still, um, the global language, I mean, I was just looking at a Balenciaga advertisement uh, the other day. I don't know if you have in mind, but it's like you see a mix, the, 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 the models are a mix of uh, uh, black and uh, and probably Asian heritage people. Um, the 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 patterns they're wearing are between African, uh, uh, um, probably some some Asian. I don't want to make it too precise. Uh, Asian um, kind of style size. So actually, the in, if you look into the fashion, but it also has to do, of course, with clients. Is going m- more and more into international, global iconography. And this, of course, is as it's in every magazine all over the world. This helps, of course, also, let's say, a local public to learn about global languages. Because to give another example, I was I was quite involved into into Indian arts uh, through um, Ashuri, and I was doing so much research in India that, of course, I mean, as a as a director or curator, you have a you have a narrow time of doing research. I was thinking, what can I bring back? And of course, I'm always interested to bring things back. Content-wise, we've been totally close to them. Visually, I knew it wouldn't work people wouldn't go into actually the content and see how close it is because visually they would be totally disturbed. The same is with the with the contemporary language of Chinese art. Even if I think in the last few years there's a huge change happened and it's it's merging more and more into let's say a global iconography and style and art. But even there, even there are themes which are Similar, but they come from such different ages. You've always talking. You've been talking about the performance, about about the performative act of a very old history. 
But if you look at what in contemporary art, let's say in the Western idea, means performative, what means, what means process, it has nothing to do with each other. And these language, to learn from each other and try to understand each other, I think we're still unfo unfortunately a bit far from each other. So it's a process. I mean, I could continue talking for ages about this, about the process and how to get these global languages into, let's say, a local or fading global um, place. <laughs> or um, I can stop I here and continue I later. I think we are in, uh, in this process here at the very moment. And Lugier, I would like to ask you what, um, as a major advocate of contemporary Chinese art, what is your experience with the Western public? What is your experience in this function between different publics and different uh, clientels in a certain way? It's in a time when Western dealers are trying to sell work to China, Western work to China, vice versa. Uh, I think you have been very successful in uh, introducing Chinese work to Western institutions, collections, and so on. What, is, what was your experience in the years of your rich experience? I, I don't need a lifetime, but three hours. Huh? Uh, actually, can I come back to the ink and chinese issue? I feel like very sentimental here. It's a little bit like homecoming. I just took uh, Craig before we started. He actually represents many artists who was my classmates. Mm -hmm. So in China, I look like very radical, avant-garde, contemporary, international, global for what I've been doing last 20 years. But actually, before that, I was studying Chinese ink painting, choreography, more than 20 years. So um, many of my classmates became the leading uh, artists in the ink painting media. So if I can start with this and come back to your question. Okay. I, I have so many questions to ask Craig, my colleagues here. When you talk about this Chinese unique aesthetic, cultural, uh, you know, specialty of understanding of body, spirit, nature, and the linguist difference between the Chinese and the so-called international. Are you talking about the Chinese painting, Zhongguohua, which in the education institution still is the name of the ink painting department? Are you talking about the Chinese painting or the ink painting? That's one, one question. Because artists I work who use oil, acrylic, they are Chinese painting. So that connects with your question about the representation or understanding or engagement about art or painting from China. That's Chinese painting. So this panel will begin with a very challenging, complex issue we are talking, we are exploring, which in China actually is 100 years debates since the early beginning of the Republic until today. People came back from Japan, from Paris, from, from Heidelberg, all participate in this debate throughout. And today is in the education institution, is in Metropolitan British Museum, the conversation, but also uh, in our daily life in the so-called contemporary art world, the Chinese painting, the ink painting. If you talk about ink painting, uh, your gallery is based on only ink, ink, I believe. Are you doing this purposely? Of course, and very successful. Um, but this token, this coin has two sides. Uh, the uniqueness, you know, it positions you in a very powerful, special, and huge responsibility. But the, uh, on the other way, do you find it difficult to negotiate between this very contemporary Chinese ink painting mm. and the so-called global contemporary art? Mm. And the third question is how's market and uh, how is the relationship with the art fairs, with, you know, with all this, you know, you know what I mean? So there's a, the, those are three questions. Mm. Um. Okay. Um, 
I, I can't say that I remember all three questions, but you can remind me if I've forgotten. I, actually, I think there's an interesting stream running through this, uh, and I want to thank Liu Jia for bringing this up, that the 100-year the history that you outlined at the beginning and you outlined in your statement is the history as seen from Switzerland. Okay? The Chinese have a 100-year history, the same period, witnessing many of the exact same things you mentioned, but from a completely different perspective. And there's a whole narrative that Luja mentioned, which happens as well, which is absolutely core to constructing the context in which contemporary art is made in China today. Uh, so we have alternate visions based on alternate histories, um, but they're parallel okay, and intertwined. Um, in answer to what, what Uli mentioned, um, you know, there is this way of thinking about art and this mode of creating art that seems very alien. But if you go back and you, you list out the fundamental presuppositions that I laid out for the art, so for instance, uh, let's see, no duality between mind and body, uh, language skepticism and a metaphoric use of language, uh, relativity of truth and the authenticity of the speaker, uh, which parallels this notion of its importance uh, of the viewer to interpret the words of an artist. And so therefore, the reader, shall we say, the reader's response being critical to the creation of meaning. Uh, I could go on and on. There's, a, there's a, a skepticism of the transcendent, and there's a focus instead on the idea of process, that everything uh, is, in fact, in the world as concrete as things seem. They're all processes unfolding in time. Um, these are actually the fundamental building blocks of what we consider to be contemporary philosophy in the West or postmodern philosophy in the West. Um, and so I would say that for those of us who feel when you're approaching this visuality and you're thinking, God, it's so different, how do I possibly penetrate it? Understand that the philosophical presuppositions of this language are in fact very much the same or similar or homologous to the presuppositions, uh, philosophical presuppositions that we consider to be contemporary art. Okay, so that's if you like to think. Okay, if you don't like to think, you like to experience the aesthetic of the art, think in terms of music. If you enjoy music, whatever kind of music you enjoy, if you take a musical aesthetic frame to start looking at a lot of these ideas, then a lot of this will come out very, very naturally, just visually, without too much intellectual thinking. So those are two things I want to lay out as possibilities to address the concern that, that Uli, Uli presented. And I have to say that Uli's understanding of the historic forces that have shaped the dialogue in China today is absolutely spot on. I think we're actually in almost like a phase transition where in our focus on contemporary Chinese art, we've been, what's been most visible to us are the Chinese artists that have said, I'm interested in joining a global dialogue, and so I'm gonna learn the global language of art, and I'm gonna create art about the condition in China today using this language so that the rest of the world can understand what we're experiencing in China today. And that's an absolutely fantastic development in contemporary art. But the phase change is going back to a group of artists now who are interested in going a step further back in history and saying there's a 2,000 year dialogue that we've been having in China ourselves and I'd like to create contemporary art that brings that whole history into the global discourse. First the discourse in China and then the global discourse. Now the challenge is different for us as viewers at this point. Okay, so whereas we in the West have been the host and therefore when we invite the guests of the world to come dine at our table, okay, we hold the conversation in English and we serve Western food, and everybody from the Western world gets to taste what it means to do and create art and experience culture from our perspective, I think we need to switch roles in the next phase and let the rest of the world be hosts, and then we can be the guests. And when we dine at those tables, we can learn Chinese, we can learn Hindi, we can learn the other languages. And actually, from Zhuangzi's perspective, and I want to point out that this is exactly the perspective that, is it Haika, has been taking. She's been taking the perspective of, I want to be the guest. And Zhuangzi said the best way to be in the world is to be constantly the guest at the 10,000 banquets as it unfolds. In other words, to always be the one learning as opposed to be the one instructing. To always be the guest as opposed to be the host.
And so I think that's the next phase change that we're going to begin to see. Thank you. Then I would like to come back so to I come back to yeah. your question. I, I, I don't have an answer, but I believe Ulix here, you are all here. I, 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 I'm more like a uh, professor asked question. I mean, you did a fantastic show in grass. It was historical, okay. it was very important. It's not only in the history of representing Chinese contemporary art in Europe, but it also has quite strong impact on the art making when the artists participate in the project, they're having the kind of dialogue and work together, seeing how their work is related and contextual in the Western institutions context. So that's like 10 years. So what do you think of the change today? And also, of course, for Uli, that's like a witnessing, participating, you know, in the whole dialogue and, and process for such a long time. To me, I would say that things has not changed and things have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this both sides, what I take. On one hand, uh, I always want to come back to education to understand how Chinese art world is so different. You think you don't only think the consumption and representation politics, you think about the production relationship. It's always go back to education. Uh, and the setting, the mainstream setting still is oil painting, uh, printmaking, sculpture, and Chinese painting, which is ink. So all those, all your paintings are not Chinese painting, just teasing. So at the main time, the thing's called contemporary. In Kafla, it's called ex uh, experimental art. In Hangzhou, China Academy, where I graduate, um, it's called uh, the, the new media, cross media, new media. This is more like a political correct. You don't, you know, you don't call contemporary, otherwise you, you are like making big trouble. So then in the uh, Chinese painting department, you have people who specialize in flower birds, people specialize in landscape and calligraphy and figurative. I graduate with figurative painting, which in Chinese tradition is practical, so it's the lowest. Calligraphy has no figure, so it's the highest. Landscape, of course, in the, in the middle. So anyway, this education setting has not changed. The other change is, if you go to the new art award, increasing like a popular last few years, you see most the candidates, they have degree from Berlin, London, California, New York, nowadays. And the conversation we already took, like uh, maybe 60% of the time, it's actually the debate in China too. The people who graduate from sculpture department or oil painting department, they wouldn't understand what you're talking. It's not their time or experience or, or, you know, or education at all. The, the, it's a similar dilemma, complexity, uh, conflict within China. So this is just to add the conversation we are you know, progressing now. Then come back to your question. It, I, I vaguely remember you're talking about the changes of um, Western dealers selling in China. That's a huge change, that's true. In fact, in Shanghai or in Beijing, all the spring season before our fair, uh, Basel, or, or you know, the, the golden time, if you see like a 40 exhibitions with 38, it would be like non-Chinese, that's a trend. And uh, at the meantime, um, I think about this whole process of since 1978, China started reform, becoming an uh, important player, uh, a member of the global community. You think about from political, diplomacy, economic, finance, technology, all this field it has been progressing in very high level of dialogue, collaboration, participation. Uh, but if you think about the contemporary art, I would say is the least developed, the most, uh, I don't know, it's, it just stayed there. And I, I, I even do, by talking about the uniqueness of Chinese, you know, special cultural, special thing, then we're moving even further away. Uh, what we've been doing the last 30 years, 40 years, uh, I'm like getting very permissive. It's, it's this, basically, is this representing Chinese 
uh, contemporary art created in China, representing in global stage through Arthur Biennale in a research publication uh, collaboration platform, the Global uh, Contemporary Art World, has been progressing. I don't think um, representing non-Chinese art is progressing. In certain way, I think it's damaging. Because only the big names, it's only the very popular, you know, hot, important uh, big names can attract the, the audience, which is nothing wrong for major museums, attract funding. But at the main time, uh, in the, 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 the more sincere, progressing, long-term engagement, dialogue through non-profit sector, and through residency, research, curatorial project, the kind of thing you, ha you see happening in, uh, in Berlin or in LA, it's still nothing happened in China, I believe. So uh, then, of course, the news is all, all, all talking about uh, the price, you know, the tech, the figures, uh, all coming to Asia. Uh, but so, yeah. at the meantime, how many solo shows or interesting group shows you did before is happening now? I, I, I actually feel it's less than less. So. So you don't see this kind of dialogue going on in China between the different positions? Uh, there's always dialogue, like uh, we are happening here, yes. it's great, but I'm only talking about uh, more like in general perspective. Well, one thing I think is happening is, is our standard is changing. So I think what Lu Jie is talking about actually is a much deeper engagement that we would actually like yes. to see. I, I, I agree yeah. completely that when I see artists that I become very, very interested in, if they've been walled away in China and are not looking at the rest of the world and looking at the international dialogue in art, then the art that they produce to me becomes much less relevant, much less interesting. What I'm advocating for is being, chi being Chinese and being contemporary, okay, is not mutually exclusive, yeah. um, that in fact you can uh, dig very deep into, into the 2000 year tradition and produce stunningly and fascinating and very divergent and different contemporary art using contemporary art concepts and language and philosophy because of the decompatibility between the pre-modern Chinese worldview and the contemporary international post-modern worldview, at least the premises, if not the actual manifestation. And I think that's a great boon for us internationally because we've lived with our postmodern world now for 30, 40 years. Uh, I don't know about you. I think I'm, get, I'm getting a bit tired of it. Um, I'd like to see uh, what is going on in the rest of the world uh, that we can learn from as opposed to always being the host and always setting the terms and conditions in which we define what is contemporary or postmodern. So it's just, I think there's just going to be a shift in the roles. And I think it's not bad not to be the center. Um, it's actually really, I think the, the huge potential for growth is in being the guest. Um, I think it's both. Yeah, Uri, yeah, I, have, I have also a question afterwards, but. Um, maybe I had a kind of conciliatory viewpoint. <laughs> uh, of course, we do have this issue, like uh, Heike just said, she doesn't know, basically, except if it's a global language. She's looking for a global language, but that's not what Greg is looking for. And uh, I think we have to understand that this global language in itself may make it accessible, but may not be so interesting. And in the end, I think that good artists will uh, convince by difference within, you know, what we call global language, convince by difference. Now, where should this difference come from? It can come from like a personal life, but I mean, most times, and that's probably very advisable to an artist, it will come where the artist has the roots. It comes from a local, regional culture, because that's the most authentic experience. And that would allow to create, on one hand, authentically, and on the other hand, create this difference in this global language. So I think 
personally, I'm looking for that type of art. I have to defend myself yes. now because I was never saying really that I was, I'm looking for uh, a global language. I was just saying the problem as an institution, like being located here is like, or what I try to avoid, I don't want to have the viewer or the visitor uh, go into exotism. I don't, I don't want to have this exotic view on it. So I need links which could be readable for the viewer. Mm. And and this is like I was just that's why I meant this this uh, Balenciaga advertisement that through all these things there there the a global language becomes more and more obvious for everyone and people are learning so it's even it's from this perspective it becomes easier to integrate art because or let's say interesting art from from whatever various backgrounds because the global language in general is is more and more built up by the uh, by the by a general public through different things through advertisement fashion whatever yeah but they they are like the proponents of what we call the global language actually it's not the global language uh, if we have like a black face and a yellow face and a white face in the same image, does not yet make it because the, the way how they communicate is a very Western. And of course, for very long, uh, and I'm not saying something new here, uh, of course, you would also share this view. Uh, the Western art world has been considered the uni universal art world. And now the movement is, is going into uh, well, opening up to other cultures and in a way you describe, but we have this problem that it's not accessible, easily accessible to our audience here. That's the problem you have to deal with. Now, for instance, every single theme exhibition uh, in the Western world or in the Asian world I could always think of a, of a very interesting work from a Chinese artist. But in most cases here, it's not there. Yeah. I'm talking about the contemporary mm. art. Because the knowledge is not here, and it's all understandable. I mean, the world is huge. But uh, you know, how to break this wall? And I think that's the concern but of uh, you know, our Oli, two friends. I now undermined. have a question to you, because you, um, um, I also hear something about the institutional and the platform where we can relate to these things. And Uli, you are involved in, a, I think, the most ambitious project uh, with an institution at the moment, M Plus in Hong Kong. Uh, there are also with Typhoon uh, different institutions developing. Uh, what is your view on it? And what do you expect from uh, uh, these institutions? Because uh, as in other places, be it in Europe or in North America, institutions were very crucial and instrumental in the development of local reception in the, uh, in the whole kind of uh, formulation of uh, the importance of art. How do you see it now with these very special Asian situations? Uh, I think the task of an institution like M Plus is to bring the, the notion of contemporary art to the Hong Kong people and to a large segment of the Chinese mainland people, because some 45 to 50 million mainland people travel to Hong Kong a year. And, uh, and I think that's one difficulty these two gentlemen fight with. The notion of contemporary art in China is very new. It's uh, facing lots of issues, like official China doesn't really embrace contemporary art. There are various reasons why that's the case. And if the audience is not exposed to contemporary art, then you know, how can they understand contemporary art? How can they appreciate it? How will they collect it if they are not exposed to it? So that's the mission of an institution like M+. 
goes for Hong Kong, where the British didn't exactly do much to bring the Hong Kong population you know, uh, to meet with culture. Uh, actually, they didn't care about this while they were still uh, governing Hong Kong. So there's a lot of catch-up to do. And do you expect that uh, this would uh, kind of also have impacts in the art community and which kind of impacts in the art community? You both. I actually think it's great things. It's, it's, uh, if you talk about a change in the last two, three decades, you know, the, the appearance of M plus, you know, is like one of the most important thing to me. It's, it's making the things go beyond China. It's, it's kind of like a looking into the Asian context and in the global context. We're having the name of, of a, a museum, uh, I don't remember the name properly, but uh, uh, it's focused not the fine arts, the autumn, or the Moma Moka is a visual culture. So there's this you know, dialogue negotiation between design, architecture, and contemporary art. You know, and it's very serious uh, uh, research, curatorial thing. We're all looking forward to that. To me, the major contribution is looking into China as focus, but not limited. And uh, it's, to me, it's very important. So I actually want to take this opportunity to, uh, to raise a critical question. Um, why, until today, we are, when we come to China, we take it as a unique, like China and the rest world. There's a danger of we, the world, and China. You know, I have very important curators always say, well, China is the most important thing I'm going to do later. You know, and then, and then after he's, he's passed away, there's no such a later, it's on the way. Because it's too big, I think that's dangerous. Why we always single out China? as a location, locale, you know, to talk about. Do we represent, do we talk about British art? Uh, well, there's a pavilion in Venice once every two years, but uh, I see this as, a, like I say, it's a, the, the, the token has two sides. On one side, you, you singular, you, you, you know, you, 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 you're complex, we can leave it. Uh, we can be lazy. Uh, the reason to curate a show uh, surrounding China is also could be laziness and could be easiness, could be like uh, uh, accessible, more accessible than talk about it is so unaccessible. Uh, there's a danger there yeah. to me. What's the reason to... Re I remember in, when I was in London in the 90s, the, the discourse was about... Uh, they, they, they used the, the, the show of Japanese uh, contemporary art in Babikang or somewhere as an as a example. And an Indian show, uh, Pompidou's um, Indian show a few years ago, all, were, all created you know, debates like why we are taking nation state as a showcase still today. Which is in Europe, it's obsolete. You, do not, you, you did it like 40 years ago, the Polish <laughs> show and so on. And that's a, that's a right so, point. you know, my own experience yeah. to understand, you know, uh, the importance of Europe and the history and the present is always not only to come to London, to Basel, to Paris. I spent 25 years to go to Balkans. You know, from Skopje to from from Athens to Skopje to Sarajevo to Kosovo, and then after that I come to the Europe, the Western Europe center to see museums or join in a debate. Then I have to go to the Baltic. Then I have to do a little bit of former Russia. Then go back to China to think about what is being Chinese, what is global, what is our time. And what is the urgency today? It's a, it's a back and forth, back and forth. Many, many layers need to peel off. I would say the current Biennale, Alpha, Gary, uh, museum system apparently is going to about the end. I'm looking forward to a new, new changes. The current setting, the dialogue, I, I would say is redundant. And uh, there got to be new changes, I believe. And the new artists, new curators, the young generation now working on that simultaneously in Asia, in Europe, in States, in Latin America, in Africa.
So you're seeing different practices coming up. I believe so. so I think Greg I, wants to I, I say wanna, something and then have a question okay. to Albert. I want to uh, propose an alternative because I think it's happening right now and I think it's very interesting and it's absolutely worth following. Um, so uh, I, I agree. It's when you categorically create a unique sort of China curatorial position, it's problematic. But I think the solution is very simple, just history. History is, is there, we can, we can establish, you know, you can have your own versions of history, but history happened, and that can be form a perfectly fine basis for bilateral curatorial engagements. So for example, in China, there's deep historical consciousness of India. Okay, so that's a very interesting historical frame, and actually literary, cultural, a mythological frame within which you can actually curate interesting bilateral shows between India and China. And that's happening, okay? And it doesn't involve Europe and it doesn't involve North America. Uh, but why not be spectators? Why not be guests at that show and learn something about the bilateral history between India and China that spans thousands of years in and of itself and has nothing to do with colonialism or post-colonialism or can be also inflected by contemporary artists in a post-colonial domain. We don't need to abandon that either. Okay? Uh, I've had fantastic engagements with Iranian artists who are recovering a notion of the Persian in the context of a Shia Islamic Iran that is geopolitically tied to China today Okay, but is historically interested in reconstructing a multi-thousand year historical exchange between Persia, Greece, South Asia, and China. That's an interesting curatorial frame in which to do work. And again, transcends the idea of the colonial or the post-colonial, but also can be inflected from that perspective as well. So what is not interesting about that? And even though it doesn't involve us in Switzerland or in the United States, so much the better. I mean, let's go out and actually be the guest yeah. at these shows and actually learn from the shows that are created. This would be a very good point to yeah, ask just, Albert. Yeah. I just can follow. Yeah, that's just that what we want to do, you know, because we are, we are dealing with, let's say, 150 different cultures in the world from Neolithic times to today. So we have special fields like Chinese art. So our two curators of Chinese art are here as well. So. Uh, uh, we, uh, just about hearing you talking to each other and, have, and hearing your uh, thoughts about uh, how, uh, how the situation is in China, I'd like to ask you what do we expect from a museum like our museum? We have uh, art from, from the world and not from Europe and we do exhibitions where, where we compare cultures uh, in, on, on a topic like at the moment on an exhibition on mirrors. So China is also just part of this global world and contemporary artists, the Chinese is also involved there. So what, would, what is your opinion what a museum like our museum should do? So f for example, what we do, our two uh, cur curators prepare an exhibition on Chinese landscape painting. It's the longing for nature, that's the title. Yeah. So, and they will select from our collection and from the collections in, in, in Europe, uh, traditional landscape painting, and they will add half of the exhibition will be contemporary art to touch other topics which are important now for today, for China, like uh, environmental, uh, topics and so on. Is this something you'd like to see or you think, oh, now they're doing so this, this, uh, uh, yeah, I just would like to know your opinion. If we, if we in, in Zurich as an institution, I think we are the most, in, most important institution for Chinese art in Switzerland. We do a lot of books and talks and, and what do you expect from, from a museum like our museum? Okay, first, I think the diachronic museum meaning the museum that collects art and looks at art over long spans of time, I think is a great site within which to do contemporary art programming. But I have two words of advice. One is have confidence, 
Meaning, even though your training does not necessarily theoretically prepare you to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with contemporary art curators and critics, using the theories that are natural to the field, um, have confidence in the theoretical background and the historic background that you have, that you bring, because you do bring a diachronic point of view that is oftentimes missing from a contemporary discussion about what art is. So A, have confidence, speak in a language that everybody can understand, don't resort to theoretical frameworks that the contemporary art people are not going to understand. But don't assume that you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the contemporary art curators within their theoretic frames. You're not expected to. Okay? But have confidence about your ideas. I always encourage classical curators to just go out and put their content out there. Um, and through engagement with other human beings who are open-minded, it'll all get worked out. Two, hire young curators. So, you know, young curators basically are trained. So they, they can, they, they'll get their art history degrees, they'll have a background that'll allow them to engage with you, but they're educated in all the same contemporary and postmodern theoretical frames that contemporary art curators and critics are. And so they can do the curation and they can do the translation necessary to make different approaches, institutional approaches, merge and create a very rich context in which to do contemporary curation. Thank you, very encouraging. And I think it's now a good moment to look into the audience and ask if there are any questions that you maybe wanted to pose uh, to this group here. Maybe we have a microphone. Yes. Wonderful. And maybe you shortly also introduce yourself by name and what, what you are. Well, thank you very much. Could you hear me? Could you hear me now? Yeah, my name is Min Häusler. I am the author of an art book, Photography and Ikebana. And I saw your show yesterday. I was very surprised when I entered. I saw nudity. And after that, I saw some photos with flowers. And I couldn't understand the relationship between the two. So I asked one of somebody there, and I will explain. Um, I just have a question that um, China according to me, is a very traditional country. How do people go um, with nudity there? Um, is there any censorship, you know, um, in art um, within this aspect? Can you show this type of uh, contemporary art in China? And how is the re reaction of the population there? This is my... Um, yes, my thought about your, your art. I could yes. answer Thank the question. You. I assume the exhibition you describe is Jiang Zhi Show, which is one of the two programs participating in the exchange here. I'm very familiar with artist's work. Talking about censorship, the shows that actually happened twice in Shanghai and Beijing, I believe. Okay, so that answers the question. Talking about uh, showing nudity, um, China, you refer in China as a very traditional society, so how is nudity? I mean, people have been doing this a hundred years. China is 5G, doing building 5G time, and you can't control nudity on 5G, it's just too fast. I answer your question already. <laughs> Back there. I noticed that during my work, it's usually the Chinese people who reach out to the West. It's also communication, cultural things, and also even the names, they take up European names when they talk to Europeans. How is it with art or contemporary art? Is it the West reaching the China or China back? I think it's happening both ways. And I think that uh, the, if I were to just describe it just uh, in terms of a little bit of recent history, I think the ecosystem in China has not been supportive of contemporary art making. So if you look at the gallery systems, except for a long march and maybe two or three other galleries in China, who's actually been working with the right kind of high ethical standards to support a healthy ecosystem for artists? Okay, lack of institutional support. God knows that we shouldn't be dependent upon the state-run institutions to support contemporary art. 
Okay, uh, what about the market? Market in China mostly driven by auction markets. Not a great place for, for primary, for, for contemporary art making. Yeah. So the, the environment in China has been very, very inhospitable towards contemporary artists making contemporary art. So where's the refuge been? The refuge actually has been the international world. Um, people like Uli, who came so early to China and paid attention to these artists. I mean, this was really critical to the development of a healthy, or not a healthy, but an alternative art environment. So I think it's been really Chinese contemporary artists seeking, um, you know, to find a host, to find a good host actually internationally. So that's a natural thing. The, the thing that's happened recently is the ecosystem in China has, has altered radically, has developed very quickly over time. Okay, state institutions haven't really changed all that much, but uh, there are an enormous number of private museums. Now, there are two kinds. One, developed by real estate developers who are trying to get a special sort of a consideration from the government, a lease, loans, what have you. You know, that falls within one category. But another category are private museums built by contemporary art collectors who are deeply passionate about art. Okay, and I, I think that those private museums are creating a completely different institutional environment for contemporary artists today. And that's a very, very healthy thing. Now you see the rise of actually very good galleries, both foreign galleries entering China and then native Chinese galleries who have actually learned how to create a healthy environment for artists. So that's radically changed. The market's radically changed. I think, and local collectors in China have become just gradually, gradually, gradually much more enthusiastic about collecting contemporary art and focusing also on contemporary Chinese art of many, many different flavors. So I would have to say, now that's creating the conditions in China in which you're going to have a lot of local production of art. And we're all hoping that the international institutions are going to take notice and be willing to curate more with a guest attitude uh, and receive the new art that comes out of this new uh, ecological environment in China. Really, I think you wanted to ask uh, If we talk specifically about art creation, then, of course, uh, the West has overpowered uh, Chinese art creation in the early stages. We talk 80s and we talk 90s. And at first, the contemporary art scene was kind of very derivative of Western art. And it took some years for the Chinese contemporary artists to find to their own language, which happened gradually throughout the 80s. And at that time, with a few exceptions only, the artists didn't want to deal in any way with their own tradition. It was all or mostly about what they considered Western conceptual art. But then after, say, the year 2000, maybe, somewhere there, uh, many artists start to get disappointed or disillusioned about the Western conceptual art. They realize it doesn't provide all the answers. And uh, so that's when a lot of them turn back to their tradition. And a few remained there uh, because they felt you know, it's such a rich resource. Others felt, well, it's a corpse, you know, it's, it's be has been beautiful, but doesn't provide me anything. Uh, other ones uh, became very cynical about it. So you could find all these reactions, but uh, more and more, they again dealt with their own roots and their own tradition. And some of it I personally find very interesting. And some of it may be more for like, uh, official China to, you know, get the support, etc. So there is all of that in today's art creation. Thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Hello, good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, debate. Uh, my name is Marcelo Nino, I'm a journalist from Brazil. Um, just uh, came back from Beijing recently, a few days ago. Um, something that you said that you mentioned was very interesting for me, that uh, the artists, there are parts of the artists in China coming back to traditional, traditional uh, um, techniques and uh, traditional in general. I would like to ask, is it a reflection of what's going on in China with this projection of confidence of China as a superpower, or this is an artistic uh, trend between artists, or it's both? 
And the second, I would like to ask your opinion about Ai Weiwei, because for most people in the West, Ai Weiwei is China, uh, Chinese art. And I've talked to uh, some artists in China, and they are a little bit disturbed about that, because they think that this is too much political, and this uh, kind of disturbed at uh, their work, because it puts too much focus on uh, politics and not in arts. So I'd like to know your opinion about these two questions. Thank you. Who wants to answer on it, Uli? Maybe part one, <laughs> uh, which is about, uh, you know, about official China and its attitude towards Chinese uh, tradition and how to promote it in the world. And there are good reasons to do that, because as we have heard, there is an enormous wealth of, of uh, um, well, symbols, thoughts, uh, theories, etc., coming out of traditional China. But uh, the Chinese government feels, you know, it's not known across the world. It's a soft power issue. If we talk about China, we all know uh, acupuncture and Chinese kitchen, but not far, not much beyond that point. So it's the hope or the plan of the Chinese government, I mean, they create Confucius Institutes, etc., to promote uh, a certain kind of Chinese culture uh, across the world. And in fact, and I think that's also Greg Greg's point, uh, if we look at today's world, there is only one culture that can how should I say, that can sustain against Western culture that has comparable depth, comparable width, comparable uh, history, and that's the Chinese culture. I mean, greater China, can we say it, we are not talking about mainland only. So, uh, you know, the, the Chinese government sees that potential, but the potential not realized. So, in that sense, yes, uh, of course, it's part of the soft power campaign, to promote, but only a certain segment of contemporary art, not all of it. I like, actually like, uh, yeah. I'd like to answer your question, uh, but not using, uh, referring to Ai Weiwei directly. I'll just use a count, uh, an alternate example. Um, so there's an artist, Xu Bing, you may have heard of. Um, in the United States, for many years, he was also considered a great a uh, critic of the Chinese government, a great dissident artist who essentially created this amazing piece called Chen Shu, which was a criticism of the government, and it was a criticism of the Tiananmen massacre, and it was all of these things, and it was none of these things. Um, so Chen Shu as a work was conceived, I think, in 1986 when Xu Bing was in the Art Academy. It had to do with his investigations of the Chinese written language and the kinds of discourses that were going on in the China Art Academy or the, the Central Academy at the time about language. We had talked about language before and the Chinese theory of language, the notion of language, and the introduction of Western ways of discussing uh, uh, key critical issues through language and logic. And the conundrum that it created for him, Book from the Sky, was that critique of the way language is used, either in China or in the West. Okay? And it has a deep Hanshui or sinological roots in its thinking, because you're talking about a way of writing language which is actually quite distinctive than the way written language is used in the rest of the world. Okay, so it's the basis actually for very good conceptual art, language-based conceptual art, the real capital C conceptual art. Okay, so this is when he left China in 1990 because of government criticism for the work. Okay, he became a dissident artist. That's actually not the origin of the work itself. It's what we wanted to see in America when we looked at Xu Bing as an artist. And what was missed were actually the very deep sinological roots to the artwork. If you go back and you look at all the art criticism on that work, only the scholars in China in 1989 who were actually writing about the work understood this. All of that criticism was ignored. Instead, Western semiotics were applied to this notion of a conceptual artist who was actually protesting the Chinese government, and that became largely Xu Bing's identity. And the deep origins of his work as conceptual art, but in relation to the Chinese written language, 
And all of that implies, what that implies, is largely ignored in Western criticism of his work. So to me, that's a reflection of, of how we would like to see Chinese art. We want to politicize it in the West. Uh, there is certainly a political valence to a lot of Chinese art, but there's a lot more going on, and it results in significant misinterpretations of the artist. We're missing the opportunity, I think, to redefine semiotics in terms of how the Chinese history has culturally used and created semiotic systems that are distinctly different from our own. And we're missing this opportunity because we're not analyzing Xu Bing's art correctly. So you are talking about... You're talking about the cliché of Chinese politics and the cliché of representing Chinese cliché politics. Um, I can also respond to your experience in China a little bit. I think I, I do fear and see and witness the growth of nationalism, not only in China. So it's accompany the rise of nationalism everywhere. That's my response. But then in connection to, is it because the confidence, is it because the power, the prosperous, the whatever reason, uh, that you know, there is this need market for the race of nationalism? I will say yes and no, especially in the visual arts context, because one of the reasons why more and more people are looking into uh, to recontextualize the negotiation between the contemporary modernity tradition, all this triangle relationship, is because um, the communication, the dialogue nowadays, the global traffic are making uh, cultural workers, artists, curators, critics try to think differently when they see the global system of contemporary art, the, the norm of conceptual art has become a cliche too. So they begin to go looking for different contexts and alternatives. I think it's very natural. I think it, now we are already entering a kind of phase of final statements and uh, I would like to ask Heike, what did you take out of this uh, talk now and uh, how you perceive this uh, both sides. Well, I have another conclusion because part of what we talked about is really how, how this, now I, now I repeat what you said, the global languages and what happens internationally. Because I was, I was thinking back in the 90s, um, I was studying part sociology and if you look at the rankings uh, internationally, at that period in the 90s, there was always, uh, in the listings, there was always one representative of one African artist allowed into these uh, 100 best artists. There was one Asian, mm -hmm. probably from China, because it's, yeah. it's the biggest. But it's like, like, say, really globally, like Africa is huge, as we know. Asia is huge, so it's like there was one from from Australia. So it was like it was ninety nine percent. It was uh, uh, Europe and uh, North American, and then there was like these five artists in between representing the rest of the world. And the strange thing is, if you look from the perspective of today, these rankings didn't change yet so much. So it's, um, no. and, and they're still quite the same. So what are we talking about? I mean, first of all, who does these rankings? Because of course it's a mix between market economy, shows you had worldwide and reputation uh, intellectually. So it's a mix of these things coming together to make up these rankings. But uh, what are these centers doing now worldwide? I mean, being created now we are talking about and uh, who in the end is deciding about these things? Where, when will be really the major shift and change? I have the feeling it's really happening at the moment um, um, when even uh, institutions like MoMA or, or the Met and whoever are asking about their relevance in the Western history when they ask themselves, what is their importance? 
do they have any importance in in the in the written history of art and but who has it and then it's like is it is it many languages joining and it's like what is your relevance in it and um so I think it's a quite interesting moment, but I'm, I think always these rankings, even if they're in a way banal, but I mean, they're kind of, in the end, from a sociological point of view, they're the representative in the end, what is really changing. So this is, uh, even with all the, the, the beautiful discussion and we had, it's like, I think it's, it's a discussion between some elite deciding or thinking about what could be changed, but in the end... What does it really mean? Absolutely. I think, yeah. And they are very much what, what, you know, get to be represented, what represent what for who is a question. I mean, you just mentioned a new change. So actually, I went to the MoMA just one week ago with my daughter. I see one room is 1912 to 1914. Then you see, you know, Paris, but you also see things from South America. Well, there's no Chinese yet. There were Chinese work made in 1912, for sure. But there was a room in MoMA, and you cannot imagine, you know, the, the, the bad period, you know, the, the, the MoMA at the beginning, or, or even 10 years ago. So there is changes. Let's celebrate that. <laughs> there will be an ink in 1912 in MoMA, but for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, there's, for example, it's very interesting. There's a major collection in Europe which has key paintings of Picasso from the early 20th century and key paintings of the Chinese painter, probably pronounce him wrong, Shi Bai Shi. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah. they're never shown together. And, but we know that Picasso collected Shi Bai Shi. Mm -hmm. And like one is in the Asian collection, the other one is in the modern collection. They even call it in Prague the French collection. And um, like they do not see the relationship between these two bodies of work yet. So I, I have a very simple answer to your question, Heike. And I, I think it's simply this, is that um, institutions right now that are at the center of how we define contemporary art discourse today uh, can broaden and deepen their approach, or they can become part of history, okay, because time marches on. Uh, and what's happening in China today, I know it's hard to look at the situation in China and say, oh, the institutions of the future are going to arise there. Um, but I think M plus is a very, very interesting institution. It's supposedly part of greater China, but it is going to have a dramatic influence on, I think, China itself. And I have to say that I've been in working with the curators at M+, um, the foundation having been established by uh, uh, Herr Sig's gift to M+, uh, and the ongoing collaborative relationship with their curatorial team, they see it. They see the regional, the, they see the bilateral, they see the traditional, and that's an institution which I think if many international institutions were to say, well, this is how M plus is interpreting the region. How can we learn from this and take our own step? Then I think you can, you know, that's a very simple thing institutions can do because M plus will put out its curatorial statements in a way that the rest of the world can understand. So just as, you know, institutions in China or in Asia look to the Tate, look to the New York MoMA at one point, I think M plus is a good institution to look to. And I think in China, I predict, that within 20 years, you will see institutions arise that put forth a point of view that's going to become extremely important for us to pay attention to, or we're going to miss it. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful statement. I don't know, Uli, Albert, if you want to add something. No, we both are, look, we both are looking forward for the opening, we, aren't we? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> to learn from M+. <laughs> um, thank you all. Thank you for holding on so long. <laughs> <laughs>